industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. In continuation of Lusitania Month, we are going to be diving into a very important theory. Well, that's what we're supposed to think, really. But um, anyway, so I want to thank my friend Travis for narrating this video. Now, this is Travis's debut of narrating, and I have to say that he has done a fantastic job. So well done, Travis, and thank you so much for contributing to narrate the video. And until then, I'm going to be leaving you in the capable hands of Travis and talk about this theory video Starting with a very important question, why did the codebreakers fail to save the RMS Lusitania? On the 7th of May, 1915, the RMS Lusitania sank off of Old Kinsale, Ireland, following a direct hit from the German submersible U-20. It sank in 18 minutes, with a loss of 1,198 lives. Over a century later, Rescue attempts and the safety of the ship have been questioned by historians. Why did the Lusitania never reply to messages from the British Admiralty? Why did Captain William Turner's actions direct the Lusitania to the German submersible? Why was the ship a military target, and how much information did the Admiralty know about German submersibles underneath the waters of the British Isles? While the subject is debatable, the evidence of the sinking has been solved. Or that's what people think. One author, Eric Larson, wrote a book that suggested there is information that the public might have missed. With the publication of his book, Dead Wake, The Last Crossing of the Lusitania, back in 2015, Larson said that historians gave the sinking a short shrift in favor of the tedious diplomatic saga that followed, defying them by looking into the tragedy further, and while doing his research for Dead Wake, Larson continued, I saw it as an opportunity to put on my Alfred Hitchcock hat. Despite Larson's optimistic enthusiasm, there have been pieces of the puzzle that don't fit, but there are some that do. So what can we theorize together to understand why the Lusitania wasn't saved in time, and why British codebreakers let her down? Theory 1. Actions of the British Admiralty On the 1st of May, 1915, the RMS Lusitania sailed out of New York City Harbor, heading towards her destination, Liverpool. While sailing in the Atlantic Ocean, the Lusitania became the visual target for the German Navy. The Germans believed that the Lusitania was a legitimate military target, despite being a passenger vessel. She became a target because the vessel might have carried cargoes of rifle, ammunition, and shrapnel shells. People were skeptical about the Germans using submarines against civilian shipping. One of them was the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill. Churchill thought the Germans were respectful of the naval warfare rules because they were aware that submarines attacking passenger vessels was a violation of the rules. However, there is some evidence that the Secret Intelligence Service might have known about the Lusitania being a target for the Germans even before the sinking. It was known that the British Admiralty held a super-secret spy entity named Room 40, before setting up the secret operation, the intelligence service was given three code books that were used by the German Navy. Once in possession, people were trained to decode the coded messages the Germans would send through wireless and telegraph traffic. During the First World War, it was estimated that the secret operation decrypted about 15,000 intercepted German communications. Somehow, British intelligence was listening in and following the movements of the submarine U-20, including the first day of its full voyage to its destination to a patrol zone off Liverpool. But didn't inform the submarine's movements to anyone except Churchill, the First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher, and Rear Admiral Henry Oliver. On board the Lusitania, fellow telegraphists David McCormick and Robert Leith would receive messages from the Admiralty to send cautious messages that the ship was sailing into a war zone within the British Isles. However, Neither the men nor the captain sent messages back to the Admiralty or other ships. For their part, the Admiralty never sent messages to Captain Turner to say that an escort cruiser that was to assist the Lusitania was cancelled. Two days before the disaster, Churchill held a briefing before leaving England to participate in a naval convention. 
His departure left Lord Fisher in charge. During Churchill's absence, the situation of the Lusitania entering into a war zone was ignored, and the Germans intercepted a signal of the cancellation for the assistance cruiser, the HMS Juno. When Churchill returned to England following the disaster, he thought that there were secrets that should be protected from the German Navy. To cover these secrets up, Churchill held Turner responsible for his actions on board the ship. Theory 2. On Board the Lusitania The next theory is the most important one of all, as it demonstrates the activity on board involving possible ill treatments of crew and passengers. It is still debatable, though this proves the closeness to the truth or at least half of it. The events had begun while the ship was in Liverpool in late April 1915. Before making the final crossing from there to New York City, a board of trade inspection had to be carried out on board as required. But according to senior third officer John I. Lewis, the crew had a mustering drill, but the lifeboats weren't lowered and were never placed in the water. The same can be said for the training of the crew and stewards, According to Captain William Turner in the Lusitania Inquiry, he commented Lord Mercy on them while they were carrying out the mustering, fire, and bulkhead drills. He explained that the crew weren't proficient in handling the lifeboats, despite their will to practice the drills. The crew and stewards somehow knew that these practices were part of the regulations, yet they didn't get the experience. When the vessel was in New York, the lifeboats were examined by Neil Robertson, the ship's carpenter. During the examination by Robertson, the lifeboats on both port and starboard sides were mustered, swung out, and lowered into the dock, but they weren't put in the water. Afterwards, Robertson gave the lifeboats the all-clear, saying they were in perfect condition, but the collapsible lifeboats were decided to not be loosened. However, Robertson failed to spot some boats that weren't in good condition, as some of them would leak during the sinking. Meanwhile, it was noticed that stowaways were hiding in a pantry carrying photographic equipment. The stowaways snuck on board and went past the cordon of secret servicemen. The stowaways were interrogated by Detective Inspector William Pierpoint, and Pierpoint had a translator with him named Adolf Peterson. It was revealed that they were German spies. In response, Staff Captain James Anderson gave them orders to confine them below decks. Whether the German Secret Service knew about this or not, it is believed that the Lusitania might have had a secret compartment which could have been located down in the cargo hold. Strangely, it was reported that in the compartment hold, the Lusitania was carrying bacon and 90 tons of unrefrigerated butter and cheese that was going to a weapons establishment in Exeter, England. But this is believed to be a cover-up for the real cargo, which was 173 tons of war munitions. If this is true, then something happened on board that made the Germans aware of them, which could have endangered their country should the British take further military action. Also down below, there were cases of silver lead containers of paintings that belonged to art dealer Sir Hugh Percy Lane. Lane was on board the ship, but he didn't survive the sinking. It is believed that they are still within the wreck and are worth around $40 million. When the Lusitania was sailing out into the Atlantic Ocean, 3rd Officer Lewis explained that an emergency boat drill was carried out involving two special boats, which are believed to be lifeboat numbers 13 and 14. In the drill, the boats were swung out by special guy wires spread out between the two davits, with a lifeline attached to these reaching down to the water's edge. Lewis described what happened during this time. Early morning, or usually every morning, the whistle would go and these men went back to muster at the emergency boat, whichever side of the ship was the lee side. There was a picked crew from the watch. In case of an accident, anybody falling over the side or any other accident, these were the men who were told off to go into the boat. They had to muster in front of the boat and see that the numbers of men were right and the two men would be standing by the fall for lowering. At each end, then after these fellows would stand at attention in front of the boats, and I would say, man the boats, and these men would get into the boats and put their life belts on, and sit in the number of their place on the boat. After I saw that everything was all correct, I would dismiss them from the boats. At 5.30 a.m. on the 6th of May, Mr. Lewis had carried out an operation and had begun on deck to raise and swing the boats out on both port and starboard sides. 
We fixed these men, there will be about six or eight men to a boat, along the port side, and then I walked to just opposite the Marconi house, where I could command both ends of the ship at the time, and ordered them when I gave the word that all boats were to go out at the same time, because if they didn't do that, there would be a mix-up of guys and one thing or another. They had to put them all out together, or they would have a deuce of a lot of trouble putting them out. During the operation, the boats were swung out and lowered down to be on a level with the collapsible boats, measuring at five feet. After they were swung out, they remained on the deck of the collapsible boat that it originally had been stowed under. By midday, instructions were given to examine the boats and make sure that they were provisioned. However, it was believed that Captain Turner never made arrangements to carry out a lifeboat drill involving both passengers and crew, and this raised alarm bells. In the evening, Turner was sent two warnings from the British Admiralty, warning to all ships about the activity of U-boats in the southern part of the Irish Channel. When the Lusitania was approaching the south coast of Ireland, where it was designated as a war zone, Turner announced a charity concert where he instructed passengers to not smoke on deck in case the light coming from their cigars would make the vessel more visible to passing submarines. At 3 a.m., the British Admiralty received news of more sinking ships in the southern part of the Irish Channel, but they didn't send out further warnings to all ships until 11 a.m. On the morning of the 7th of May, Staff Captain James Anderson and Chief Steward John Jones had closed the bulkhead doors on E-Deck. When the British Admiralty had radioed warnings about the activity of U-boats while sailing in tense and foggy weather near the channel, Turner adjusted the Lusitania's course and her speed, thinking submarines would be more likely to keep to the open sea and the ship would be safer close to land. Sadly, he had made the wrong decision, and this led him into the war zone. In the afternoon, the Lusitania was sailing about 10 miles off the old head of Kinsale, when she was spotted and struck by a torpedo from the German submarine U-20. When it was hit, the Lusitania began to sink by the bow and instantly, lifeboat number 5 was destroyed by the impact, splintering it into pieces. Despite this, Captain Turner gave the order to turn the ship hard to starboard, trying to reach land for safety. He didn't realize the ship was sinking while this was taking place. Passengers who did notice were in terror and were confused as to why the lifeboats weren't launched. Panic came across the ship, but Anderson thought the Lusitania wasn't sinking. He reassured passengers that there was nothing wrong and suggested to one that they should return to the lounge. However, Inexperienced crew members and stewards knew the ship was going down, so leaving everything in their hands and not wishing to wait for the captain's orders, they told the passengers to get into the lifeboats. While one boat, lifeboat number 18, had begun loading passengers, a seaman stood by, holding an axe ready to knock out the pin holding the boat down. Having lost his patience and seeing water creeping up the forecastle, New York businessman Isaac Lemon pulled out a revolver and confronted the seaman. When he did, the seaman responded with the words, It is the captain's orders not to launch any boats. To hell with the captain, cried Lehman. Don't you see the boat is sinking? And the first man that disobeys my orders to launch the boat, I shoot to kill. The sailor knocked the pin out, but the boat swang back on board and slipped down to deck with the starboard list, instantly crushing people to death or pinning them to the wall outside the veranda cafe. Ten minutes after impact, Captain Turner gave the order, all women and children into the boats first, and to lower the lifeboats down to the rails. Straight away, all the collapsible lifeboats were loosened from their lashings and freed. However, survivors later said that when the lifeboats were eventually lowered, the boats on the port side had difficulty lowering into the sea. This was because of the heavy list to starboard, and the boats on the port side where they would have scrapped and bumped down the side of the ship. Some of them would either break into pieces, swung out to the deck, or instantly turn, plunging people into the water. But in one terrifying scene, Lifeboat 11 crushed occupants of Lifeboat 9, which was in the water. As a result, the lifeboat sank and those in number 9 were either injured or killed. In 
In the end, only six lifeboats were launched successfully. Some of the other lifeboats were leaking in the water, and they were fouling the side of the ship, and in one case the stern post was wrenched away. In one case, survivor William Cairns reported that when a boat was beginning to fill up with water, he jumped out and swam away. When the Lusitania was heavily listing to starboard, Anderson ordered women and children to attend to the lifeboats. Then Anderson came up with an idea to right the ship. He was known to have said to the ship's junior third officer, Go to the bridge and tell them they are to trim her with the port ballast tanks. However, this plan had failed as officers told Anderson that doing this action was impossible. Then, Anderson halted the launching of lifeboat 10 before giving the order, Stop lowering the boat. Clear the boat. She's not going to sink. There is no danger. The Lusitania sank within 18 minutes. But given the actions of both men, what happened to the captain and staff captain on board, and were they responsible for putting their crew and passengers in danger? Theory 3. Actions of Captain Turner and Staff Captain James Anderson Upon learning of his survival following the disaster, the First Lord Admiral Jackie Fisher wrote to Winston Churchill, As Cunard would not have employed an incompetent man, it is clear that Captain Turner is not a fool, but a knave. Judging by the harshness of Fisher's words, Captain William Turner became a scapegoat because Winston Churchill wanted to cover up the evidence about the Lusitania carrying secret cargo. This was partly because the Admiralty didn't want to publicly mention the cargo in case the Germans would put British ships in danger. Cunard Line also took the blame out on Turner for the same reason. While he was made a scapegoat, Turner's actions played a role in terms of communication and lack of training for his crew. But was this true? To understand that, we need to give a brief background of Turner, and a second man who was on board with him. Turner had been a Cunard employee since 1878, and during his time with the company, he became popular with the passengers and crew. He was known for being respectful, but his attitude must have changed by the time of the disaster. In May 1915, Turner was reappointed to command the Lusitania, as he had been a replacement for Captain Daniel Dow, who left Cunard following a mental breakdown. Turner took charge when the vessel left from Liverpool to New York City in late April 1915. He was then joined by Staff Captain James Anderson, who was given certain tasks while Turner was navigating the Lusitania. This included inspecting cargo stowage, discipline, and socializing with passengers. The pair, alongside other stewards and crew members, sailed to New York City and when the Lusitania was docked at Pier 54, Anderson learned about German spies. After they were interrogated, Anderson gave orders to confine them below deck. They remained on board the Lusitania and died in the sinking. On the 6th of May, passengers were concerned about the lifeboat drill cancellation. Turner and Anderson were aware of their concerns, but Turner had somehow instructed crew members not to explain the situation. These are explained in survivor testimonies when Turner angrily dismissed the concerns. However, in the evening, he reminded passengers that the ship was entering into a war zone and instructed them not to light cigars or cigarettes on deck. As for Anderson, he had to explain during a party to a passenger that the cancellation was the captain's decision. On the morning of the 7th of May, Anderson and Chief Steward John Jones had closed the bulkhead doors on E-deck, while Turner changed the Lusitania's course, which brought her towards the German submarine U-20. When the U-20 struck the Lusitania, both Turner and Anderson didn't think the ship would sink. However, Turner tried to turn the ship so it could safely reach land. It wasn't until 10 minutes later that he learned the Lusitania wouldn't make it to shore, so he called out for women and children to enter the lifeboats. Anderson didn't think the Lusitania would sink, and thinking he was right, he reassured passengers that they should return to the lounge. He even instructed the crew to stop lowering lifeboat number 10 as there was no danger. But in the ship's final moments, Anderson told the ship's junior third officer to go to the bridge and tell the crew they are to trim her with the port ballast tanks. This would be impossible to complete. When the ship was making her final plunge, Anderson was calling out to passengers who could swim to leave an overturned collapsible lifeboat. Turner went to the wheelhouse where he awaited to go down with the Lusitania. 
However, a huge wave swept him off the ship and into the ocean. The captain clung to a deck chair in the water and lost consciousness. He was picked up from the water three hours later. Anderson didn't survive, and his body was recovered in battered condition. Although Anderson couldn't be blamed for his actions, it was clear that since the Lusitania was Turner's responsibility to command, he was the one that got the blame, and this would impact his mental health for the rest of his life. So why did British Codebreakers fail to save the Lusitania, despite the intelligence service cracking codes from German naval codebooks, receiving messages about submarine activity within the Irish Channel, blaming the captain for his actions, and knowing about the secret cargo? We don't know. We don't know the full answer to what happened, especially since the evidence the British Admiralty kept before the disaster was never released to the public. Over a century later, there are no plans to release them. Until we know the answers to the disaster, we may never know the truth on whether the sinking was an accident waiting to happen, or if the Admiral team had made plans to sink the Lusitania. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.